Hi, everybody. And welcome back to um, our Birds of Newfoundland series. We are on week nine now. Um, we're talking about habitats of Newfoundland today. So I chose the, the header picture here because um, it actually very conveniently shows quite a few different habitats that we see in Newfoundland um, that we're going to be talking today. Um, we've got some high elevation um, barrens up here. We have some coniferous forests. We have a bog, which is a wetland down in the bottom there and coastal habitat as well. So we'll be going through some of these things as the night progresses. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, for anybody who's new, my name is Jenna McDermott and I am joined today with uh, Catherine Deal, who's my colleague. Um, she'll be monitoring the chat tonight. Um, and working a little behind the scenes. And we both work for an organization called Birds Canada. And Birds Canada is a nonprofit organization um, that's present all across the country. And our mission is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. Um, so we work to carry this mission out by conducting strong science and establishing innovative partnerships with other organizations and industry. And we also work to increase public engagement with birds um, and with conservation issues. And each year we have roughly 70,000 volunteer citizen scientists across the country who are collecting data for our Birds Canada programs. And so in Newfoundland right now, uh, we are running the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, which is our one of our main programs here. Um, we will be having a webinar on April 4th. So that's just in two weeks now, um, another of the Monday night, Monday night um, series. Um, that's all about the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. You can come to that if you're not registered yet, definitely um, go register for that. And you can learn more about how the Atlas works, um, how you can be involved because there's different levels of involvement, some that are um, quite low time cost and some that are higher time cost. So you can really um, be involved to whatever extent interests you. And yeah, so definitely come to that webinar on the 4th. And the basic rundown of what we're doing with the Atlas is we're trying to map the distribution of each of the species of birds that breeds on the island. So for example, we have a Wilson's warbler here and it has been seen at each of those squares on the map that has a color in it um, throughout the last two years of data collection that we've been doing. Um, so the project is carried out by volunteer citizen scientists and people of any level of ability are welcome and encouraged to participate. And our other main project that we're running in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey. And Catherine will be doing a presentation actually this Thursday about the Owl Survey. So if you haven't signed up for that one yet um, and you're free on Thursday evening at 7.30, definitely register for that one. I'll send the link in the follow-up email for this week again as well. Um, and in that, you'll be able to learn how the Owl Survey works. Again, how you can get involved um, and, and what sort of things are involved with it and just more about owls, which is always a good time. And I'll just quickly mention again that another Birds Canada program run by our colleague um, is the, um, the loon survey. So you can help track breeding loons by visiting your favorite lake three times this summer. Um, and you can get more information at the link on the bottom there about that survey as well. Before we really get into it for the night, I would like to, as always, thank all of our partners, funders, and supporters, um, because without their support, we wouldn't be able to put on um, good webinars like the ones we've been doing here um, to try and engage people like you. So for e this evening, um, it's going to be a little bit different than the weeks that we've gone through before, because we have gone through nearly all of the bird species that are expected to breed here in Newfoundland over the last eight weeks. Um, other than next week, we're going to be going over the species at risk, uh, which Catherine's going to be covering. So tonight's presentation will be a little bit different. I'll be going through first some information on what exactly a habitat is, how animals, which are birds included, fit, uh, fit into habitats, 
and how habitats can change over time and what sort of causes, uh, what things cause habitat change. And then we'll be going through some of the main habitat types that we find in Newfoundland. Um, you can see a list of them down the bottom there on the screen. And as we go through each of the habitat sections, I'll be showing you pictures of some of the most common bird species you'll find in each habitat. And I will be using pictures of males um, because they're often the ones that you see more clearly since they're out in the open singing, protecting their territories. And these um, pictures of birds that I'm showing you are going to be a refresher or a sort of quiz about all the things that we've learned over the last eight weeks. Um, and so we'll be putting up polls about them. You can feel free to join in on the quizzing. It's just for fun though. It doesn't matter if you do well or not, as always. Um, it's just a little bit of a practicing opportunity as we go through this. Okay, so um, first of all, we'll just describe what a habitat is. In the simplest terms, a habitat is the place that an animal, plant, or other organism makes its home for a certain part of the year. So migratory species will have a specific habitat that they use during the breeding season, which for the birds we're talking about today is here in Newfoundland. And they may have a different sort of habitat that they use in the wintering grounds as well. And to make a habitat um, that a bird can be successful in, it needs to have four basic things. And these are the same things that humans need as well. These are shelter, water, food, and space. And so having these four things will allow a bird to survive and also be successful in hatching and raising their young. So when we talk about shelter for birds, it's not really the same as it is for humans. It doesn't necessarily involve walls and a ceiling, but rather it can be anything that will hide them from weather and more importantly, from predators. This can include things like a single bush or a single tree, um, a rock cliff, a riverbank, some dense plants on the forest floor, fallen logs, anything like that. When we talk about water for birds, they need water to drink and also to bathe, um, but different species do need different amounts of water. So some do get their water from the food they eat. For example, raptors will get it from the meat that they eat. And so they don't really need to drink water on its own. Um, but then if we talk about sparrows who eat seeds and have a drier sort of diet, they definitely need to drink um, as a separate activity. And a bird drinks water by filling their bill up, put their face down, fill their bill up, and then tip their head back so that the water just travels down the throat with gravity um, because they don't have the same sort of cheek muscles that we do to like slurp water in um, and swallow it. <laughs> and when we're talking about birds drinking, um, they don't necessarily need a river, stream or pond or a large body of water to drink from. They'll drink from small puddles or even they can drink little water droplets off of leaves after rain or from the morning. Uh, the morning dew. And they'll do the same thing with bathing. They're bathing to clean the feathers, which helps um, keep them in good shape. And if the feathers are in good shape, then they can protect themselves from the elements, stay warmer and drier. So birds, of course, also need sufficient access to food. And they will be found in habitat that provides enough of the type of food they eat to succeed. So this could be seeds, could be insects, fish, or other birds or animals, whatever it is that they eat. And when we talk about space for birds, we're talking about the space they need to create a territory that they'll be defending from other birds and from predators uh, that they can raise their young in. So if there's not enough space, so for example, a section of forest is too small or a wetland shrinks, then they might not be able to live there anymore. <clears throat> and when aspects of a habitat change, it sometimes doesn't mean that a bird can't occupy that space anymore. It just, um, <clears throat> might mean that different birds are occupying that space instead of that one species. So there can be many reasons for habitat change or loss of habitat. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, many of these changes are caused by humans, but some are also natural. So I've shown a few of them, um, a few pictures of habitat changes on the slide here. On the top left, um, we're in we are in a town or a city and we're talking about sort of human development. So where that new house is that's just being built 
um, used to actually be a continuation of the little forest stand that you can see behind it. Um, so that sort of halved the amount of space there, which could have changed uh, whether or not a bird could uh, breed and live there. And there's other ways that human habit or other ways that humans take away habitat from birds, and that can be filling wetlands for development. Um, where we are adding houses or stores, um, cutting forests down for farmland. There's lots of different things. Basically, we are creating more human habitat and taking away animal habitat. <clears throat> In the top middle there, um, we have a picture of a spruce budworm. It's that little, little caterpillar in the middle. Um, it's an insect that Catherine mentioned in the warbler week. And when we have outbreaks of spruce budworm, they can actually defoliate many hectares of forest. So they eat the needles off all of the trees and then the trees will eventually die. Um, and this is a natural process, um, but it can definitely change the landscape a lot and change the habitats that are available. So the trees can die and they'll become an open area. Um, and this should in time regenerate back into a forest again as um, seeds, seeds fly in and plant new trees. Um, there are other natural disturbances to forest habitat, like uh, wind, wind events that knock down all the trees and kill them, um, and forest fires as well. And these are all natural occurrences in the boreal forest. In Newfoundland, we've had in the past, um, and it's a little more under control now, is hyperabundant moose, which means that there are higher amounts of moose than the ecosystem can really support properly. And moose like to eat the tender little um, tips of balsam fir trees and other young trees as they're starting to grow. So when we have too many moose and you get into this area that the forest is trying to grow back in, they can stop that um, succession in, the, in its tracks. And so then you end up with what is called these moose meadows. So that can be another way that habitat has changed as well. Um, on the top right and the bottom picture, we also have, um, I've just shown a picture of forest that has been cleared for forestry activities. And so basically we're cutting down older forests and using it for um, paper products or um, other wood products. And then if all things go well, then this area should also regenerate into new forest after of course, several years. Um, and then we have other causes of habitat change, which can include mining, Climate change, which is always um, something that we need to worry about for this kind of thing. Um, creating trails uh, for recreation, like hiking trails, biking trails, ATV trails, all that kind of thing, um, and other invasive species as well, like the moose. So every time a habitat is changed, it doesn't necessarily mean that nothing can live there anymore, but it will change the species that are present in an area. Um, for example, the logged area that you can see in the top and bottom. After a few years, you would get early succession bird species there like Lincoln sparrows and Wilson's warblers. They're living in the shorter shrubbier trees as they grow. Um, but then you'd be changing, of course, from the old growth species that would have used to been there. For mined areas, sometimes it can create areas for bank swallow colonies. Um, and so as habitats change, also the bird species present in an area will change. And this is one of the reasons that having a breeding bird atlas for Newfoundland is so important because then we can use the data about where different species are right now, especially species at risk, which we need to be managing for, especially um, during industry activities and development. And then we can use that baseline data that we collect now in the future when we're planning for changes to the landscape. And then we can help plan the changes in a way that minimize or lessen the impacts when we do make those changes for the bird species. And when we talk about bird species, um, each one is going to have either one specific habitat or um, multiple different habitats that they can live in successfully. And so if they have only one specific habitat they can live in, that's called a habitat specialist. Um, and if they can live in multiple different habitats, then they'd be called a habitat generalist. So habitat generalists are able to persist and deal with changes in their environment much better than species with a more specialized habitat requirement. 
because they can still live in an area even if something changes about it. So for example, this American Robin that I have here, um, it's a habitat generalist, sort of the quintessential habitat generalist. You can find robins basically anywhere in any habitat on the island. Um, and so if, for example, this robin was living in a mixed forest at the edge of the town and the town expands and creates a new development in the area the robin was living, the robin comes back the next year and it could still um, succeed and breed successfully in that area because robins can also live in towns. Um, but let's say we have the same, the same thing happens with this red-winged blackbird, who's also on the slide here, and they need to live in marshes, and it lives near, in a marsh near town. Um, but then the town expands and they fill the marsh in to make space for housing or stores, and that red-winged blackbird, when it comes back the next year, it won't be able to live there at all anymore because it needs to live in a marsh. It would have to find a new place to live. And so birds, species, aren't grouped perfectly into like these two distinct categories, but rather they're on a sort of spectrum here based on how many different types of habitat they can successfully use. And so we are gonna start going through some of the major habitats now, and we'll go through some of the most common birds we find in them. But also as we go through, remember that some species can be found in multiple types of habitat. And I will just be showing you um, just a few of the most common species in each one. So the first habitat we're going to look at is urban habitat. Um, and it's maybe not what we first think of when we think of a good place for birds, um, but it can be, some species can be quite successful here. So urban habitat can look a bit different depending on the area, of course. Um, so on the picture on the top, we can have areas with more trees and grass, with lawns and bushes. Um, and on the bottom, which is down in St. John's, um, we have, of course, uh, more houses and less vegetation in sort of the central downtown area. But the key description of an urban habitat is that the birds are sharing the space with the humans, or humans are sharing space with birds, depending how you want to think about it. Um, and birds in urban habitats will often use food that's left by humans. You can think of pigeons eating scraps from the sidewalk. Um, they can use water that comes from puddles on the roads. Um, and they can also use human buildings as part of their shelter as well. So an interesting thing about urban birds is that there are differences in urban versus rural or wild populations of the same species. So urbanized birds will increase how often they sing and they'll sing louder um, to make up for the noise of the city. Um, and they're often bolder or braver than their counterparts that are not living in the city. Um, the amount of predators and the amount of avail available food is often different for urban birds as well compared to rural birds, which can cause changes in the length of their breeding season. They may breed earlier if, um, things are warmer in the city or, or trees um, put out their leaves earlier than in rural areas. And um, this can also cause birds to lay more eggs sometimes to make up for lower survival um, because there could be also increased predation in the city or increased mortality. So we'll go to our first bird. Um, and uh, Catherine, I can't remember how to make a pool. Never mind, I remember. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll be starting a pool in a second, and I'm only going to leave them open for thirty seconds, just um, in in the to save our time here a little bit, since we we're going through a few different species again. Um, but let's just look at this bird first. Um, so you're walking along the street, you look up at some wires and you see a bunch of these birds sitting on the wires. What do you think these birds are? The pole should be up there now. You can let me know if it's not. Okay, so I'm going to close it down. 
And uh, we have an overwhelming majority that says this is a European starling. That's correct. Um, so you can get these huge groups of starlings in cities. Um, and if you see them flying around, it's called a murmuration. It's really cool to watch them fly around as a flock. Uh, Red-winged blackbird would um, have a big red patch on the wing and a common grackle um, has a bit of a heavier, heavier bill that doesn't have any yellow on it. Um, so that, that would be the difference there. Okie dokie. Let's move on to our next slide here. So we have another bird here. Um, you can see this small bird maybe flying out of a little hole in some siding, um, might land on a windowsill and you can take a look at it. Um, so what do you think this bird is? I like how confident everyone's feeling today. Okay, I'm gonna close it down. Very good, everybody. This is a house sparrow, it's a male house sparrow. Um, we had a few people say it's a dark-eyed junco. Dark-eyed juncos are gray on their back and white on the belly, um, but they're fully slate gray on their back. Um, and a song sparrow has a lot of streaking on its, on its sides and belly and doesn't have sort of that black face. Um, very good job. So um, house sparrows are really uh, interesting because they'll build a nest in sort of any small cavity they can find. This can include things like gaps behind loose siding, uncovered house vents, or even electrical openings like this one that um, is in the bottom left there. Um, this little, I'm not really even sure what it is on the wires over uh, out on the telephone wires. Um, I've had house sparrows breeding in there, nesting in there every year since I've lived in this house in Cornerbrook. So you never know where you're gonna find them. <laughs> Okay, here is another bird. We're not going to have a poll on this one because I think probably most people already know what they are. Um, but you're walking around in town, you can look up on the roof of a house and maybe you'll see like 10 of these pigeons. Um, pigeons are also known as rock doves. And rock doves, like their name suggests, can also breed on cliffs rather than just in towns. <laughs> um, and actually, if you're out in St. John's, you can see some if you walk the trail from the Battery in St. John's up to Signal Hill, there's a crack in the rock um, near the beginning of that hike. And there's always pigeons in there uh, year round, I think. But when they are in cities and towns, pigeons will nest on window ledges and balconies or on really any other flat spot that they find that's suitable. Um, and so the pigeon here, the house sparrow and the European starling, those three that we just saw, they're all actually introduced species from Europe and they all do extremely well in towns and cities. Okay, here's our next bird that does really well in urban areas. They will build nests on overhangs above doors. They'll build nests under raised decks in the rafters or gutters of a shed. And you'll often see them eating berries in the winter or the fall and picking up worms in the summer. So, Let's see how everyone feels about knowing what this bird is. <laughs> okay, we're doing good here. All right, so I'll close it down. And um, most people got this right with American Robin, that is correct. Um, Rose-breasted grosbeak does have um, a like bright reddish pink area on the breast, um, but they don't have sort of that big orange bill or those white around the eye. Um, and they have a quite a different looking bill than a Robin does. Okie dokie. There, I only just shared that now. 
Okay, so that's the urban habitat. We're going to move on now to the coastal habitat. Okay. So coastal habitat is sort of a general term for where the land meets the ocean. Um, and a main similar similarity between species that you'll find breeding in coastal habitat is that they are using both the land and the ocean to provide their needs. So the land on its own can also be a separate type of habitat uh, for other birds that are just using the land section. But for species that are using the ocean as well, we can expect some of our most iconic species like our seabirds to be nesting in coastal habitat on either small ledges in steep cliffs or on islands that are close to shore. And we can have also other birds like ravens and some of our raptors that will also nest on these steep cliffs too. The shelter that we are speaking about um, uh, in coastal areas is provided by these steep cliffs. And so they keep birds safe from land predators like foxes. And um, the food in this area will come from the ocean since these birds will be diving for fish. When we talk about protecting coastal habitat, we also need to remember that that will include the ocean that surrounds it since it's providing really half of the resources that anything needs to live in a coastal area. Um, apart from the seabirds, you'll also find gulls, terns, bald eagles, shorebirds, and osprey along the coastline. So we'll go through a few um, quote unquote quiz species here. So let's say you go to Cape St. Mary's Ecological Reserve. You can see a lot of common coastline species like this one here. And not only are they using the land they're nesting on, but they're also using the ocean around it, as I mentioned before. Um, and these birds, can sometimes fly hundreds of kilometers to find good fish supplies to bring back for their chicks. So what do you think this bird is? All right, we're doing very good here. Okay, I'm gonna close this down. Okay, so very good job, everybody. These are Northern Gannets. Um, herring gulls look uh, different in the way that their bill is shaped um, and they also, are quite a bit smaller. That was hard to tell size, obviously, from a picture. And you're right, this is not a pterodactyl. <laughs> um, so when we talk about um, protecting coastal habitats for northern gannets and some of the other seabirds, as I mentioned, we also need to protect ocean. So ocean warming, which is caused by climate change, has a huge effect on these birds that are diving for fish because um, a fish will live in a certain sort of column in under the water, depending on what temperature they like to live in. And these seabirds can also only dive to a certain depth in the water. So if the fish species that they are used to catching moves up or down the water column, depending on if the temperature of the ocean is warming, they'll probably move farther down to stay in the cold water. And so then things like the northern gannet might not be able to dive deep enough to be able to catch them. So that's just something to keep in mind um, as an interesting fact and also um, something that we should be paying attention to as the years go on. Okay, so we'll go to our next birds here. Um, these birds also nest on the ledges of steep cliffs along the coast in huge colonies. You can see them at Cape St. Mary's as well. And they also fly into the ocean to find fish. Um, so who do you think this bird is?
Okie dokie. So I'm going to close it down. And we'll share these ones. And so most people got this right with a common mer. It is a common mer. Um, this was a bit of a tricky one because thick build mers do look very similar. Um, their bill is, as their name suggests, a little bit thicker, but that's kind of hard to tell. But they also have uh, that different shape of the white area on the breast. And if you need a refresher on your um, seabirds, you can definitely always go back to watch that seabirds presentation um, that Catherine gave near the beginning of our series. The razor bill also looks a little different because um, they have a very differently shaped bill. It's quite a bit broader. Okay, good job, everybody. Here is our next bird. Um, these birds, again, you can find them at uh, Cape St. Mary's Ecological Reserve, and they also nest on the ledges of steep cliffs along the coast in quite large colonies. Um, they make these little <laughs> nests along the cliff edges that you can see like in the picture here, um, and they're also fishing in the ocean. So who do we have here? Okie dokie. I'll close this one down. Okay, so 66% um, of people are very correct. This is a black legged kitty wake. Good job. Um, the ring bell gulls, herring gulls, and common terns, they do nest in coastal areas, but they're not sort of nesting on these uh, steep cliffs. They'll be nesting more on small islands offshore usually um, that have kind of grassy areas on top usually. And so they nest in a different kind of area. But also when you look at them, they look a little bit different. Um, common terns have a much sharper bill and also a black cap on their head. And herring gulls and ring bill gulls have a different look to their beak. And also you can just see the feet poking out of this bird uh, as it sits on its nest and they're black. Very good, everybody. So this is our final bird for the coastal area. And um, it may be familiar to many people. You can often see these birds along the coastline hunting. They're not necessarily breeding where you see them because they can move around quite a bit when they're foraging. Um, and so what do you think this bird is? Lots of good answers coming in on this one. Okay, I'll close it down. And share. And here we have uh, the majority says bald eagle. That is correct. Well done. Um, this one was maybe a little bit tricky because um, it's not quite in its adult plumage yet. It still has a little bit of darkness on its head um, and its tail's a bit hidden, so you can't see that it's entirely white there. But it is a bald eagle. It's probably around four years old or maybe three. Um, so it's not fully adult yet. Um, but it does have this big, heavy hooked bill that you'll see on a bald eagle um, compared to an osprey. Lovely, good job. Okay, so we'll move on to our next habitat type here. And this is the barrens or tundra. Um, the barrens or tundra can be found in a few different places in Newfoundland. So this can be up at the tops of mountains where the climate is pretty rough. It's rough enough to keep tall vegetation from growing. So there's no trees or bushes, um, just sort of low plant cover grasses and lichens, that kind of thing. This is usually caused by a shorter growing season um, that's due to deep or late snow cover which sort of shrinks the amount of summer that they get. 
And also there could be low nutrient or very rocky soil that can't support a lot of plant life or high winds as well. And so we also see these barrens or tundra along coastal areas like we were just talking about. Um, and these are also windswept areas and they're subject to difficult climate um, coming off of the ocean. But when we're talking about barrens and tundra, we are talking about these um, areas where there is very little vegetation other than short grasses um, and there's a lot of rocks and it's all very kind of flat. So the birds that live in these areas um, rely very much on camouflage. And they're usually, because of that, they're usually browns or grays to blend in with the ground or the rock. What we'll see in these areas are a few species of sparrows, some pipits, larks, um, northern harrier, harrier short-eared owl, and rock ptarmigan if you go up, up to the top of mountains. And so one species um, that we'll talk about is the horned lark. And I'm doing ID pointers for this instead of um, a poll because we haven't actually discussed the horned lark before. We sort of forgot to add it into our previous weeks. <laughs> um, but this is the horned lark. It lives in, in tundra areas along coastlines. And the males in the main picture here, uh, the main feature for him is this yellow face with these black markings so that he has a black mask, a black breastband, and a black forehead. And their name, uh, horned lark, comes from these tiny horns that they have on the top of their head, which are a bit hard to see in this picture. They're just poking up a little bit. Um, and they're just feathers, they're not actually horns. So the horned lark also has a brown back and wings and pale underparts or pale to white underparts. The female's up in the top there. She has the same markings as the male, except for that the black of the face and the head is not nearly as pronounced. Um, so it's quite a bit faded or gray or speckled instead of this sharp black. The horned lark has an upright posture and it has long legs, which are almost like a thrush, it hops around on the ground. And um, I'll play this, the song of the horned lark because I know Catherine loves it a lot. <laughs> and so if you hear this song, like a little tinkling bell while you're out in a coastal sort of tundra area, um, this is a horned lark. Except for maybe it's not working. So that's a horned lark. Okay, so here's our first um, quiz species. Um, so you find yourself in sort of a grassy area or a coastal trail where there's not a lot of trees or vegetation and you might come across this species here. Who do you think this is? This is a tricky one, I have to say. Okay, I'm gonna just close it down and we'll talk about this one. 60% um, of people said Savannah Sparrow and that's correct. So well done. Um, this one is tricky because sparrows are difficult. <laughs> so um, the Savannah Sparrow, the main marks for that are this sort of yellow, eyebrow or that yellow area in front of the eye between the bill and the eye. Um, the white throated sparrow also has yellow there but has black and white stripes on its head instead of brown. The Lincoln sparrow doesn't have the yellow and neither does the song sparrow but the Lincoln sparrow also has really fine streaks on the breast and the song sparrow um, has sort of these broad streaks but it's missing that yellow. So that was a tricky one but well done everybody. Um, Savannah sparrows are found in this grassy open habitats, like you would see in the barrens or tundra, and they nest on the ground as well, um, hidden by clumps of grasses. And so if you see a sparrow dive into cover in a place like this, you could be dealing with a savanna sparrow. Okay, here's our next bird. Um, so let's say you're in 
an open area, a tundra or barrens area, you see a bird flying past and it's flying low over the ground, it's following every rise and fall of the ground. And it looks like this bird. Who is this? Looks like people have good memories on them today. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll. So um, this is a Northern Harrier. Um, this is actually female. I guess I said I was using pictures of males, but this is a female. Um, the Northern Harrier, the key for them compared to a short-eared owl is uh, this white rump, um, the white section just at the base of the tail. And also if you look closely, if you can see uh, closely enough, um, they have a sort of different shape bill than the, than the owl. And so the Northern Harrier does use these open areas for hunting. They're using their sort of owl shaped face feathers um, to listen for movement of small mammals as they fly overhead. And then they'll kind of pounce on them uh, from the air. They also nest on the ground and they hide their nests in thick clumps of vegetation, even though it's pretty short. Okay, so we're going to move on now to our next habitat type. This is wetlands. And the boreal forest, which is what Newfoundland is part of, has the largest concentration of wetlands on the planet, which is very cool. There are several different kinds of wetlands, but the main feature of all of them is that they're waterlogged in a way that there's standing water, but it's less than two meters high. So the picture at the top is a marsh which is what a lot of people automatically think of when we say the word wetland. But we have actually a relatively small number of marshes on the island compared to other wetland types. Marshes have shallow water with vegetation or plants growing up through the water like bulrushes or cattails that you can see in this picture. On the bottom picture, we have a bog and bogs are mostly made up of smag sphagnum moss, <laughs> which you can see um, at the bottom of this picture, the moss down at the bottom is sphagnum moss, and it's a, a type of moss that can absorb a huge amount of water, and it also makes the environment very acidic. Because of this, not many different plants can live in bogs, but you'll see uh, species like pitcher plants, which is also in the picture here, and it's uh, Newfoundland's provincial flower. You can see bake apples or cloudberries, cranberries, Labrador tea, tamarack larch and black spruce, they can all live in bog areas. So bogs can range from having no vegetation other than moss and some grasses, all the way up to having a fair bit of stunted trees or shrubs growing in them. And bogs are a really important ecosystem to protect um, to combat climate change because um, the plant matter in them doesn't decompose very quickly, which means that they actually store huge amounts of carbon in them rather than releasing it to the atmosphere. In Newfoundland, we do also have swamps, and you'll know when you're in one because <laughs> you think you're in a regular forest, but you're actually constantly getting your feet wet, or there's puddles everywhere, or as you walk, the ground sort of sinks underneath you and is completely saturated with water. And the last type of wetland um, that I'll mention here is open water, and these can look a lot like just a regular pond, but they'll be very shallow and they'll have plants like water lilies growing up from the bottom. Um, and all of these wetland areas are popular places for ducks to breed. And um, in our follow-up email, I'll send a link to a, a wetlands document that Ducks Unlimited made, and it's got an interesting breakdown of all these wetland types if you want to learn more about them. So birds that are living in wetlands are finding shelter sort of in any of the places that plants are growing. They're hiding between grasses or tight branches, and they're usually eating insects off of the vegetation as well. We'll see a lot of ducks, shorebirds, warblers, sparrows, blackbirds, and swallows in wetlands. So this picture, in this picture, we have a marsh because you can see the cattails are growing up from it. Um, and this species that you see here is only found in Newfoundland in marshes. They'll build their nests attached to cattail stalks, 
which are, uh, so the nest is suspended in the air. And you don't often see the females, but the males like this one will perch on top of the plants and sing. So you can tell me what you think this bird is. Lovely, so I'm gonna close this one down. And so nearly everybody said a red-winged blackbird, which is correct. A uh, rusty blackbird has the same shape and the same sort of bill, but it doesn't have that red patch on the, on the wing. Um, so that's a red-winged blackbird. And it's very exciting to see one in Newfoundland. <laughs> okay, so we'll go on to our next area here. So this is a different kind of wetland. This is a bog, like I mentioned. Um, so we have in this picture some small shrubs on the left in the middle and farther in the distance we have some larger patches of stunted trees. The whole ground is wet and squishy as you walk on it and you can see a bird like this sitting on top of a taller tree or snag and it will call incessantly at you. It may even come close to dive bombing you as you walk through the bog um, and even if you leave the bog area and go somewhere else it might still chase you there. <laughs> so what do you think this bird is? Okie dokie. I'll close this one down. And we have 80% of people said greater yellow legs and it is a greater yellow leg. So good job. Um, everybody else identify that this is a shorebird, which is correct. Um, but the greater yellow legs has these huge long yellow legs, which are really key for them. Um, and spotted sandpiper is quite a bit shorter um, and often will have some speckles on its belly. Um, and a quite a bit shorter bill actually. And a Wilson snipe is really like a kind of football shaped bird. <laughs> so um, the greater yellow legs will nest on the ground as well, but they are very territorial. So they'll lure you away from their nest by calling from a completely different location, uh, which is why I gave you that little story. <laughs> okay, here's another bird that you uh, might notice a little flash of yellow and some scrubby bushes that are in the bog and when you get a good look you might see that it looks like that bird here and what bird do you think this is? Okay, I'll close this one down. So this is in fact a common yellow throat, like most people thought. Um, the other is that they're tricky because they're almost the yellow, but the common yellow throat does have this very distinct uh, black mask on its face with that uh, bright white above it. Um, so the other ones look a little different than that. Okay, we'll move right along here. Um, so as you walk through the bog, you might hear some chipping that uh, sounds like it's coming from the ground underneath some low vegetation. And eventually this bird might pop up into a small tree and you'll see this, uh, this is what it looks like. So who do you think this is? Oh, 
also sorry if I seem to be closing down the polls quickly, uh, but I don't want to make us all too late this evening. Okay, this one's definitely a tricky one. And I'll close it down, share. So this one, um, most people said a swamp sparrow. This is actually a Lincoln sparrow. So that's a very tricky one because you would think a swamp sparrow um, is going to be in a wet area, which it is. So that's a very good guess. Um, but a swamp sparrow has a sort of rusty bright cap on its head. Um, and whereas this Lincoln sparrow has this gray eyebrow and sort of stripes on the head. And as well, it has these very fine streaks going down the side and the breast. Um, and the white-throated sparrow will have black and white stripes on its head. But the sparrows, again, are very tricky ones. So um, good job, everybody. OK, let's move on to our last one for the wetland area. Um, so this bird will nest in shallow marshes or small ponds with forested edges. And you can tell me what bird you think this is. Okay, I'll close this one down. Um, so the majority got it right. It's ring neck duck. Um, this is a tricky one as well because I gave you all the dark the dark ducks as options. <laughs> um, so the ring neck duck, you can see the ring on the neck a little bit here, but really you're looking for a fully black head and back, and it has a ring around the bill. Um, black scoters are all black except for a bright orange bill, and a greater scop has a gray back instead of a black one. So um, I'll just mention again that different duck species are present in different wetland types. And so you can go back to the ducks presentation if you want to review that, because I think we mentioned um, what areas they live in during that as well. OK, we'll move on to our next category here. And this is um, the coniferous forest. So you can easily find coniferous forests all across Newfoundland. Basically, they're made of coniferous trees, which are evergreen trees and mostly they're black spruce and balsam fir uh, with some pines in certain areas of the island. Um, they can vary what they look like depending how old they are. So for example, the picture on the far right is a younger balsam fir forest. It's coming back after logging and it's really dense with the young fir trees are incredibly close together and they're quite short, um, only a little taller than me. Um, this forest may have slightly different species using it than for example, an old growth forest like the one that you see in the middle, which is actually a spruce forest. An old growth forest has larger gaps between the trees. And because of that, some of the smaller plants can also grow between them, which provides multiple layers of cover for birds to use. And so we also can see differences in bird species that use coniferous forests based on the elevation they're in. So for example, this bird here is more likely to be found higher in the mountains and can be hard for some people to hear who have older ears or some hearing damage. They forage for insects among the tree branches with their little needle-like bill. Who do you think this is? Okie dokie. So I'll close this one down. And this was a tricky one because we have a bird that's um, all black and white. So black and white warbler was a fair guess, but it's actually a black pole warbler. Um, black and white warbler has sort of black and white stripes on the head, um, whereas this black pole warbler has a fully black cap. Okie dokie. We'll move on to our next quiz bird. 
And you can find these birds in basically any coniferous forest, but they especially like lower scrubbier trees. And they'll sing all morning, um, even sometimes at night, and they'll sing in any weather that you could find. Um, who do you think this is? Okie dokie, I'll close this down. And we have 86% of people saying white-throated sparrow and that is correct. Um, the white crowned sparrow is the only other one that has black and white stripes on its head and it doesn't have that yellow in front of the eye, it has black there as well. So this is a white-throated sparrow. Okay, so here we have sort of a bit of an older spruce forest where the trees are taller, they're full of cones, um, and a flock of birds flies by and lands in a tree and they all start foraging there. So what are these birds like you see in the picture here? Okay, I'll close this one down. So uh, this is a white wing crossbill like um, most people thought. And you can tell by looking at the bill, uh, first of all, that it's a crossbill. And the red crossbill doesn't have those white patches on the wings. Um, the pine grosbeak could be a bit confusing if you're not seeing the bill so well, but um, pine grosbeaks don't have this sort of um, black patch on the back of the cheek. Okay, perfect. So here we have a coniferous forest um, that's pretty thick. There's no holes in the canopy that let the light in when you're not on the path. Um, and you hear this beautiful flute-like sound drifting out and then you catch a glimpse of this bird here. What do you think this is? Okay, so I'll close this one down. And we have again, 63% uh, of people said a hermit thrush and that's correct. Um, so this is a thrush because it has these long legs, uh, sort of upright posture. They're hopping around on the ground, looking for insects that are hidden under the leaves. Um, and you can tell that this is a hermit thrush specifically because it has that red tail compared to the color of the rest of its body. So the rest of the body is sort of a grayer brown and the tail is this uh, rustier red color. Um, hermit thrushes can also live in mixed forest, not just in coniferous forest, um, but they are hopping around on the ground as well, just like the other thrushes. So we're gonna actually move on now to the deciduous and mixed forest. And it looks like I may be talking slowly today, so we might go a bit over time, so I apologize. If anyone needs to leave, of course, feel free. Um, and we will have the recording. I'll send it out to you afterwards as well. Um, but I hope you stick around. <laughs> so we do have forests in Newfoundland that are composed of deciduous trees, um, like birches, for example. So these are trees that lose their leaves in winter. And you can also get forests that are a mix of both deciduous and coniferous trees. Those are somewhat more common than just deciduous forests here. 
And both of the pictures here are mixed forest. Like in coniferous forests, mixed and deciduous forests can look different depending on how old they are. And the um, nice thing for birds about deciduous forests is that the leaves are perfect for hiding behind, which makes it difficult for people to see them. But they also can attract a lot of caterpillars and moths, which are great food for birds and for their young. And some bird species also will collect the caterpillar silk to weave into their nests. Um, perfect. So let's move on to this bird here. Um, in a mature mixed forest, you'll have adult trees, other plants along the forest floor, and you might hear this bird singing from right at the tippy top of the trees. So it's sometimes hard to get a peek at them, but let's say you did get a look at it. Um, this is what it looks like. What do you think it is? This bird actually will make hanging cup nests. So they attach the rim of the nest in sort of a V of the branches and they weave this hanging nest out of grasses, strips of bark, um, and they actually use spider webs to glue it together. Okay. Close this down. Um, so we have a bit of a, a split vote here with all the side flycatcher or blue-headed vireo, but the majority wins here. It is a blue-headed vireo. Um, and they have this really distinctive sort of greenish body and this like uh, dark gray head with uh, these white spectacles. It's very distinct compared to any of the other species there. Um, these ones, if you can get a peek at them, they're very cool to see in real life. Okay, so you might also walk along in the forest and suddenly you hear this huge commotion bursting from beside you in the woods. And once you finally calm your heart down and look around, you might see this bird walking around on the ground or perching awkwardly on a branch. So what do you think this bird is? Okay, so I'll close this one down. And good job, everybody who said ruffed grouse. This is a ruffed grouse. Um, they are tricky to tell the difference from a spruce grouse um, sometimes, but a spruce grouse will have sort of a brownish rusty color at the tip of the tail. Um, but they'll both surprise you from the woods uh, crashing around in the bushes. Also, the habitat is a good clue here because spruce grouse are usually found in coniferous forests, whereas rough grouse are usually found in mixed forest. Okay, so we'll do another bird from um, mixed or deciduous forest. These ones are often found sort of at edges along stream banks, and they're always flitting around. They're very active. They'll fan their tails out, and so you can see the color on the tails and wings really easily as they're flying around. So who is this bird? Okay, looks like answers are in. I'll close it down. And here we have, um, most people said American Red Start. That's correct, well done. Um, the American Red Start is really the only one that has this uh, very distinct all black with a white belly and these um, very bright sections on the wings, the tail and sort of in the or wing pit. <laughs> um, the yellow warbler, uh, the yellow rumped warbler um, doesn't have this black on the head and the chest. Um, so that's this like, uh, this solid black, I mean. At the Northern water thrush is um, 
brown mostly, and it has uh, brown streaks down a pale underbelly. Um, so this is an American red start. And in some areas of the island, you can actually get huge numbers of them in like one area. So with every 10 steps, basically, you take down a little road, um, you could see another male singing, um, which is really cool. Okay, we'll move on to our final habitat section here. And this one's sort of uh, a strange one to pick, I guess, because <laughs> it's really just one thing I'm talking about. I'm talking about alders. So deciduous shrubs are these broadleaf plants, um, short, short plants, and they're typically alders here in Newfoundland. Um, and they're a very prominent feature along old logging roads, along ATV trails, um, in transmission lines, they're along the trailway. And they also can occur naturally along the edges of forest um, where it's turning to a wet zone or into early regeneration areas. So alders are um, typically pretty short or a little bit higher than a person. Um, they are very dense and the stems, if you've ever tried to walk through a, a clump of alders, the stems are like a big octopus trying to trip you with all of its tentacles. Um, <laughs> so I would recommend not trying to go through them. <laughs> but all this to say is that alders can be packed with little birds. Um, and often these birds are quite colorful, but they are incredibly good at hiding in the dense foliage. So you might not even get a chance to see them all the time. However, this first bird here is by far the most numerous bird you'll see in here in alder patches. Um, it's bright yellow, it's an exuberant singer, and you can usually get a good look at these ones. So who do you think this bird is? Okay, so I'll close this down in a second here. So well done, 95% got yellow warbler. This is a nice, bold male yellow warbler singing his heart out. Um, they are completely yellow, except for these sort of uh, brown streaks on the chest. Um, all these other species that I have as options are, are also found in alder thickets. Um, <laughs> so if you see any, of, uh, you could look up any of those names and take a peek at how those birds look different from each other. I'll move on here to our next one. This is another common bird in alders or in vegetation that's just growing back after disturbances and sort of regenerating habitat. Um, and it's usually a little bit harder to see because it's typically skulking around in the bushes, uh, but it is a very loud singer. Who is this? Okay, I'll close this down. And we have here that 51% said morning warbler, which is correct. This is a male war morning warbler. And he has this really distinct um, gray hood and a black patch on the chest, which is why I tried to trick you with the black throated green warbler, because they also have a black section on the throat and chest. But habitat is really important to talk about between these two because black throated green warblers are going to be found not in short alder thickets like this, but they'll be fine, uh, found in kind of um, mixed or deciduous woods high up at the very tops of the trees. So that's just a, another little note from this, <laughs> this poll. Okay, we'll move on to our final bird of the night here. This is another common little yellow colored bird that will um, breed in these older patches and regenerating areas. And they're usually in drier areas, not really wet ones. Um, so what is this guy?
I close it down. And here we have 65% um, of people said Wilson's warbler, and that is correct. This is a Wilson's warbler. And although all of the birds that I've given here as options are quite yellow, um, the Wilson's warbler is the only one that has this black cap on his head. Um, but again, all of these other species that I put in the list here can also be found in alders. Okay. So that brings us to the end. Um, that's all the habitats we'll be going through. There is, of course, some overlap or nuances between and within the habitats. And we have also, of course, only gone through a few of the most common species that you'll find in the habitats we've gone through. But I think the key point for tonight to take away is that if you're having trouble identifying bird and you have a few options that you think it could be in your field guide, for example, make sure to look um, at the descriptions of habitat and you might be able to hone in on one of the better options or narrow down your options a little bit more. And also once you get more practice or are more comfortable with birding, um, you also get a better idea of what you're going to expect in certain habitat that you find yourself in as well. So thanks everybody for sticking around. Sorry that I ran a little bit late. Um, I'm <laughs> proud of you all for your very good bird ID skills tonight. And um, make sure to come to the Atlas presentation. They'll be coming up soon. Um, I know that you all can identify a bunch of species now, so it doesn't take a lot of your time if you don't want it to. Um, so I encourage everyone to check out the Atlasing webinar. Uh, to see how you can put your new skills to work. Um, and hopefully we'll see a bunch of you next week for the Species at Risk workshop. Thanks everyone. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or um, speak out loud. <laughs>